Part two, chapter six of Concerning the Spiritual in Art by Vasily Kandinsky, translated by Michael T. H. Sadler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Chapter six: The Language of Form and Color. The man that hath no music in himself, nor is not moved with concord of sweet sounds, is fit for treasons, stratagems, and spoils the motions of his spirit are dull as night and his affections dark as erebus let no such man be trusted mark the music the merchant of venice act five scene one musical sound acts directly on the soul and finds an echo there because though to varying extents music is innate in man everyone knows that yellow orange and red suggest ideas of joy and plenty de la croix these two quotations show the deep relationship between the arts, and especially between music and painting. Goethe said that painting must count this relationship her main foundation, and by this prophetic remark he seems to foretell the position in which painting is today. She stands, in fact, at the first stage of the road, by which she will, according to her own possibilities, make art an abstraction of thought, and arrive finally at purely artistic composition. Painting has two weapons at her disposal, one, color, two, form. Form can stand alone as representing an object, either real or otherwise, or as a purely abstract limit to a space or a surface. Color cannot stand alone. It cannot dispense with boundaries of some kind. A never-ending extent of red can only be seen in the mind. When the word red is heard, the color is evoked without definite boundaries. If such are necessary, they have deliberately to be imagined. But such red, as is seen by the mind and not by the eye, exercises at once a definite and an indefinite impression on the soul, and produces spiritual harmony. I say indefinite because in itself it has no suggestion of warmth or cold, such attributes having to be imagined for it afterwards, as modifications of the original redness. I say definite, because the spiritual harmony exists without any need for such subsequent attributes of warmth or cold. An analogous case is the sound of a trumpet, which one hears when the word trumpet is pronounced. This sound is audible to the soul, without the distinctive character of a trumpet heard in the open air or in a room, played alone or with other instruments, in the hands of a postillion, a huntsman, a soldier, or a professional musician. But when red is presented in a material form, as in a painting, it must possess, one, some definite shade of the many shades of red that exist, and two, a limited surface divided off from the other colors which are undoubtedly there. The first of these conditions, the subjective, is affected by the second, the objective, for the neighboring colors affect the shade of red. This essential connection between color and form brings us to the question of the influences of form on color. Form alone, even though totally abstract and geometrical, has a power of inner suggestion. A triangle, without the accessory consideration of its being acute or obtuse angled or equilateral, has a spiritual value of its own. In connection with other forms, this value may be somewhat modified, but remains in quality the same. The case is similar with a circle, a square, or any conceivable geometrical figure. As above, with the red, we have here a subjective substance in an objective shell. The mutual influence of form and color now becomes clear. A yellow triangle, a blue circle, a green square, or a green triangle, a yellow circle, a blue square. All these are different and have different spiritual values. It is evident that many colors are hampered and even nullified in effect, by many forms. On the whole, keen colors are well suited by sharp forms, for example, a yellow triangle, and soft, deep colors by round forms, for example, a blue circle. But it must be remembered that an unsuitable combination of form and color is not necessarily discordant, but may, with manipulation, show the way to fresh possibilities of harmony. Since colors and forms are well-nigh innumerable, their combination and their influences are likewise unending. The material is inexhaustible. 
Form in the narrow sense is nothing but the separating line between surfaces of color. That is its outer meaning. But it has also an inner meaning, a varying intensity. And properly speaking, form is the outward expression of this inner meaning. To use once more the metaphor of the piano, the artist is the hand which, by playing on this or that key, that is, form, affects the human soul in this or that way. So it is evident that form harmony must rest only on a corresponding vibration of the human soul, and this is a second guiding principle of the inner need. The two aspects of form just mentioned define its two aims. The task of limiting surfaces, the outer aspect, is well performed if the inner meaning is fully expressed. The outer task may assume many different shapes, but it will never fail in one of two purposes. One, either form aims at so limiting surfaces as to fashion of them some material object. Two, or form remains abstract, describing only a non-material, spiritual entity. Such non-material entities, with life and value as such, are a circle, a triangle, a rhombus, a trapeze, etc., many of them so complicated as to have no mathematical denomination. Between these two extremes lie the innumerable forms in which both elements exist, with a preponderance either of the abstract or the material. These intermediate forms are at present the store on which the artist has to draw. Purely abstract forms are beyond the reach of the artist at present. They are too indefinite for him. To limit himself to the purely indefinite would be to rob himself of possibilities, to exclude the human element and therefore to weaken his power of expression. On the other hand, there exists equally no purely material form. A material object cannot be absolutely reproduced. For good or evil, the artist has eyes and hands, which are perhaps more artistic than his intentions, and refuse to aim at photography alone. Many genuine artists, who cannot be content with a mere inventory of material objects, seek to express the objects by what was once called idealization, then selection, and which tomorrow will again be called something different. The impossibility and, in art, the uselessness of attempting to copy an object exactly, the desire to give the object full expression, are the impulses which drive the artist away from literal coloring to purely artistic aims. And that brings us to the question of composition. Pure artistic composition has two elements. One, the composition of the whole picture. Two, the creation of the various forms, which, by standing in different relationships to each other, decide the composition of the whole. Many objects have to be considered in the light of the whole, and so ordered as to suit this whole. Singly, they will have little meaning, being of importance only in so far as they help the general effect. These single objects must be fashioned in one way only, and this not because their own inner meaning demands that particular fashioning, but entirely because they have to serve as building material for the whole composition. So the abstract idea is creeping into art, although only yesterday it was scorned and obscured by purely material ideals. Its gradual advance is natural enough, for in proportion as the organic form falls into the background, the abstract ideal achieves greater prominence. But the organic form possesses all the same an inner harmony of its own, which may be either the same as that of its abstract parallel, thus producing a simple combination of the two elements, or totally different, in which case the combination may be unavoidably discordant. However diminished in importance the organic form may be, its inner note will always be heard. And for this reason, the choice of material objects is an important one. The spiritual accord of the organic with the abstract element may strengthen the appeal of the latter, as much by contrast as by similarity, or may destroy it. Suppose a rhomboidal composition, made up of a number of human figures. The artist asks himself, are these human figures an absolute necessity to the composition, or should they be replaced by other forms, and that without affecting the fundamental harmony of the whole? If the answer is yes, we have a case in which the material appeal directly weakens the abstract appeal. The human form must either be replaced by another object, which, whether by similarity or contrast, will strengthen the abstract appeal, or must remain a purely non-material symbol. 
once more the metaphor of the piano for colour or form substitute object every object has its own life and therefore its own appeal man is continually subject to these appeals but the results are often dubbed either sub or super conscious nature that is to say the ever-changing surroundings of man sets in vibration the strings of the piano the soul by manipulation of the keys the various objects with their several appeals the impressions we receive which often appear merely chaotic consist of three elements the impression of the colour of the object of its form and of its combined colour and form that is of the object itself at this point the individuality of the artist comes to the front and disposes as he wills these three elements it is clear therefore that the choice of object that is of one of the elements in the harmony of form must be decided only by a corresponding vibration in the human soul and this is the third guiding principle of the inner need the more abstract is form the more clear and direct is its appeal in any composition the material side may be more or less omitted in proportion as the forms used are more or less material and for them substituted pure abstractions or largely dematerialized objects the more an artist uses these abstracted forms the deeper and more confidently will he advance into the kingdom of the abstract and after him will follow the gazer at his pictures who also will have gradually acquired a greater familiarity with the language of that kingdom must we then abandon utterly all material objects and paint solely in abstractions the problem of harmonizing the appeal of the material and the non-material shows us the answer to this question as every word spoken rouses an inner vibration so likewise does every object represented to deprive oneself of this possibility is to limit one's powers of expression that is at any rate the case at present but besides this answer to the question there is another and one which art can always employ to any question beginning with must there is no must in art because art is free with regard to the second problem of composition the creation of the single elements which are to compose the whole it must be remembered that the same form in the same circumstances will always have the same inner appeal only the circumstances are constantly varying it results that one the ideal harmony alters according to the relation to other forms of the form which causes it even in similar relationship a slight approach to or withdrawal from other forms may affect the harmony nothing is absolute form composition rests on a relative basis depending on one the alterations in the mutual relations of forms one to another two alterations in each individual form down to the very smallest every form is as sensitive as a puff of smoke the slightest breath will alter it completely this extreme mobility makes it easier to obtain similar harmonies from the use of different forms than from a repetition of the same one though of course an exact replica of a spiritual harmony can never be produced so long as we are susceptible only to the appeal of a whole composition this fact is of mainly theoretical importance but when we become more sensitive by a constant use of abstract forms which have no material interpretation it will become of great practical significance and so as art becomes more difficult its wealth of expression in form becomes greater and greater at the same time the question of distortion in drawing falls out and is replaced by the question how far the inner appeal of the particular form is veiled or given full expression and once more the possibilities are extended for combinations of veiled and fully expressed appeals suggest new light motifen in composition without such development as this form composition is impossible to anyone who cannot experience the inner appeal of form whether material or abstract such composition can never be other than meaningless apparently aimless alterations in form arrangement will make art seem merely a game so once more we are faced with the same principle which is to set art free the principle of the inner need when features or limbs for artistic reasons are changed or distorted men reject the artistic problem and fall back on the secondary question of anatomy but on our argument the secondary consideration does not appear only the real artistic question remaining 
these apparently irresponsible but really well-reasoned alterations in form provide one of the storehouses of artistic possibilities the adaptability of forms their organic but inward variations their motion in the picture their inclination to material or abstract their mutual relations either individually or as parts of a whole further the concord or discord of the various elements of a picture the handling of groups the combinations of veiled and openly expressed appeals the use of rhythmical or unrhythmical of geometrical or non-geometrical forms their contiguity or separation all these things are the material for counterpoint in painting but so long as color is excluded such counterpoint is confined to black and white color provides a whole wealth of possibilities of her own and when combined with form yet a further series of possibilities and all these will be expressions of the inner need the inner need is built up of three mystical elements every artist as a creator has something in him which calls for expression this is the element of personality two every artist as child of his age is impelled to express the spirit of his age this is the element of style dictated by the period and particular country to which the artist belongs it is doubtful how long the latter distinction will continue to exist three every artist as a servant of art has to help the cause of art this is the element of pure artistry which is constant in all ages and among all nationalities a full understanding of the first two elements is necessary for a realization of the third but he who has this realization will recognize that a rudely carved indian column is an expression of the same spirit as actuates any real work of art of today in the past and even today much talk is heard of personality in art talk of the coming style becomes more frequent daily but for all their importance today these questions will have disappeared after a few hundred or thousand years only the third element that of pure artistry will remain forever an egyptian carving speaks to us today more subtly than it did to its chronological contemporaries for they judged it with a hampering knowledge of period and personality but we can judge purely as an expression of the eternal artistry similarly the greater the part played in a modern work of art by the two elements of style and personality the better will it be appreciated by people today but a modern work of art which is full of the third element will fail to reach the contemporary soul for many centuries have to pass away before the third element can be received with understanding but the artist in whose work this third element predominates is the really great artist because the elements of style and personality make up what is called the periodic characteristics of any work of art the development of artistic forms must depend on their separation from the element of pure artistry which knows neither period nor nationality but as style and personality create in every epoch certain definite forms which for all their superficial differences are really closely related these forms can be spoken of as one side of art the subjective every artist chooses from the forms which reflect his own time those which are sympathetic to him and expresses himself through them so the subjective element is the definite and external expression of the inner objective element the inevitable desire for outward expression of the objective element is the impulse here defined as the inner need the forms it borrows change from day to day and as it continually advances what is today a phrase of inner harmony becomes tomorrow one of outer harmony it is clear therefore that the inner spirit of art only uses the outer form of any particular period as a stepping stone to further expression in short the working of the inner need in the development of art is an ever advancing expression of the eternal and objective in the terms of the periodic and subjective because the objective is forever exchanging the subjective expression of today for that of tomorrow each new extension of liberty in the use of outer form is hailed as the last and supreme at present we say that an artist can use any form he wishes so long as he remains in touch with nature but this limitation like all its predecessors is only temporary from the point of view of the inner need no limitation must be made the artist may use any form which his expression demands 
for his inner impulse must find suitable outward expression. So we see that a deliberate search for personality and style is not only impossible but comparatively unimportant. The close relationship of art throughout the ages is not a relationship in outward form but in inner meaning, and therefore the talk of schools, of lines of development, of principles of art, etc., is based on misunderstanding and can only lead to confusion. The artist must be blind to distinctions between recognized or unrecognized conventions of form, deaf to the transitory teaching and demands of his particular age. He must watch only the trend of the inner need and hearken to its words alone. Then he will with safety employ means both sanctioned and forbidden by his contemporaries. All means are sacred which are called for by the inner need. All means are sinful which obscure that inner need. It is impossible to theorize about this ideal of art. In real art, theory does not precede practice, but follows her. Everything is, at first, a matter of feeling. Any theoretical scheme will be lacking in the essential of creation, the inner desire for expression which cannot be determined. Neither the quality of the inner need nor its subjective form can be measured nor weighed. Such a grammar of painting can only be temporarily guessed at, and should it ever be achieved it will be not so much according to physical rules, which have so often been tried and which today the cubists are trying, as according to the rules of the inner need which are of the soul. The inner need is the basic alike of small and great problems in painting. We are seeking today for the road which is to lead us away from the outer to the inner basis. The spirit, like the body, can be strengthened and developed by frequent exercise. Just as the body, if neglected, grows weaker and finally impotent, so the spirit perishes if untended. And for this reason it is necessary for the artist to know the starting point for the exercise of his spirit. The starting point is a study of color and its effects on men. There is no need to engage in the finer shades of complicated color, but rather at first to consider only the direct use of simple colors. To begin with, let us test the working on ourselves of individual colors, and so make a simple chart, which will facilitate the consideration of the whole question. Two great divisions of color occur to the mind at the outset, into warm and cold and into light and dark. To each color there are therefore four shades of appeal, warm and light or warm and dark, or cold and light or cold and dark. Generally speaking, warmth or cold in a color means an approach respectively to yellow or to blue. This distinction is, so to speak, on one basis, the color having a constant fundamental appeal, but assuming either a more material or more non-material quality. The movement is an horizontal one, the warm colors approaching the spectator, the cold ones retreating from him. The colors which cause in another color this horizontal movement while they are themselves affected by it, have another movement of their own, which acts with a violent separative force. This is, therefore, the first antithesis in the inner appeal, and the inclination of the color to yellow or to blue is of tremendous importance. The second antithesis is between white and black, that is, the inclination to light or dark, caused by the pair of colors just mentioned. These colors have once more their peculiar movement to and from the spectator, but in a more rigid form. Yellow and blue have another movement which affects the first antithesis, an X and concentric movement. If two circles are drawn and painted respectively yellow and blue, brief concentration will reveal in the yellow a spreading movement out from the center and a noticeable approach to the spectator. The blue, on the other hand, moves in upon itself like a snail retreating into its shell and draws away from the spectator. In the case of light and dark colors, the movement is emphasized. That of the yellow increases with an admixture of white, that is, as it becomes lighter. That of the blue increases with an admixture of black, that is, as it becomes darker. This means that there can never be a dark-colored yellow. The relationship between white and yellow is as close as between black and blue, for blue can be so dark as to border on black. Besides, this physical relationship is also a spiritual one between yellow and white on one side, between blue and black on the other, which marks a strong separation between the two pairs. An attempt to make yellow colder produces a green tint, 
and checks both the horizontal and eccentric movement the colour becomes sickly and unreal the blue by its contrary movement acts as a break on the yellow and is hindered in its own movement till the two together become stationary and the result is green similarly a mixture of black and white produces grey which is motionless and spiritually very similar to green but while green yellow and blue are potentially active though temporarily paralyzed in grey there is no possibility of movement because grey consists of two colours that have no active force for they stand the one in motionless discord the other in a motionless negation even of discord like an endless wall or a bottomless pit because the component colours of green are active and have a movement of their own it is possible on the basis of this movement to reckon their spiritual appeal the first movement of yellow that of approach to the spectator which can be increased by an intensification of the yellow and also the second movement that of overspreading the boundaries have a material parallel in the human energy which assails every obstacle blindly and bursts forth aimlessly in every direction yellow if steadily gazed at in any geometrical form has a disturbing influence and reveals in the colour an insistent aggressive character the intensification of the yellow increases the painful shrillness of its note yellow is the typically earthly colour it can never have profound meaning an intermixture of blue makes it a sickly colour it may be paralleled in human nature with madness not with melancholy or hypochondriacal mania but rather with violent raving lunacy the power of profound meaning is found in blue and first in its physical movements one of retreat from the spectator two of turning in upon its own centre the inclination of blue to depth is so strong that its inner appeal is stronger when its shade is deeper blue is the typical heavenly colour the ultimate feeling it creates is one of rest when it sinks almost to black it echoes a grief that is hardly human when it rises towards white a movement little suited to it its appeal to men grows weaker and more distant in music a light blue is like a flute a darker blue a cello a still darker a thunderous double bass and the darkest blue of all an organ a well-balanced mixture of blue and yellow produces green the horizontal movement ceases likewise that from and towards the centre the effect on the soul through the eye is therefore motionless this is a fact recognized not only by opticians but by the world green is the most restful colour that exists on exhausted men this restfulness has a beneficial effect but after a time it becomes wearisome pictures painted in shades of green are passive and tend to be wearisome this contrasts with the active warmth of yellow or the active coolness of blue in the hierarchy of colours green is the bourgeoisie self-satisfied immovable narrow it is the colour of summer the period when nature is resting from the storms of winter and the productive energy of spring any preponderance in green of yellow or blue introduces a corresponding activity and changes the inner appeal the green keeps its characteristic equanimity and restfulness the former increasing with the inclination to lightness the latter with the inclination to depth in music the absolute green is represented by the placid middle notes of a violin black and white have already been discussed in general terms more particularly speaking white although often considered as no colour a theory largely due to the impressionists who saw no white in nature as a symbol of a world from which all colour as a definite attribute has disappeared this world is too far above us for its harmony to touch our souls a great silence like an impenetrable wall shrouds its life from our understanding white therefore has this harmony of silence which works upon us negatively like many pauses in music that break temporarily the melody it is not a dead silence but one pregnant with possibilities white has the appeal of the nothingness that is before birth of the world in the ice age a totally dead silence on the other hand a silence with no possibilities as the inner harmony of black in music it is represented by one of those profound and final pauses after which any continuation of the melody seems the dawn of another world black is something burnt out like the ashes of a funeral pyre 
something motionless like a corpse. The silence of black is the silence of death. Outwardly black is the color with least harmony of all, a kind of neutral background against which the minutest shades of other colors stand clearly forward. It differs from white in this also, for with white nearly every color is in discord or even mute altogether. Not without reason is white taken as symbolizing joy and spotless purity, and black grief and death. A blend of black and white produces gray, which, as has been said, is silent and motionless, being composed of two inactive colors, its restfulness having none of the potential activity of green. A similar gray is produced by a mixture of green and red, a spiritual blend of passivity and glowing warmth. The unbounded warmth of red has not the irresponsible appeal of yellow, but rings inwardly with a determined and powerful intensity. It glows in itself maturely, and does not distribute its vigor aimlessly. The varied powers of red are very striking. By a skillful use of it in its different shades, its fundamental tone may be made warm or cold. Light warm red has a certain similarity to medium yellow, alike in texture and appeal and gives a feeling of strength, vigor, determination, triumph. In music it is a sound of trumpets, strong, harsh, and ringing. Vermilion is a red with a feeling of sharpness, like glowing steel which can be cooled by water. Vermilion is quenched by blue, for it can support no mixture with a cold color. More accurately speaking, such a mixture produces what is called a dirty color, scorned by painters of today. But dirt, as a material object, has its own inner appeal and therefore to avoid it in painting is as unjust and narrow as was the cry of yesterday for pure color. At the call of the inner need, that which is outwardly foul may be inwardly pure, and vice versa. The two shades of red just discussed are similar to yellow, except that they reach out less to the spectator. The glow of red is within itself. For this reason it is a color more beloved than yellow, being frequently used in primitive and traditional decoration, and also in peasant costumes, because in the open air the harmony of red and green is very beautiful. Taken by itself, this red is material, and like yellow has no very deep appeal. Only when combined with something nobler does it acquire this deep appeal. It is dangerous to seek to deepen red by an admixture of black, for black quenches the glow, or at least reduces it considerably. But there remains brown, unemotional, disinclined for movement, an intermixture of red is outwardly barely audible, but there rings out a powerful inner harmony. Skillful blending can produce an inner appeal of extraordinary, indescribable beauty. The vermilion now rings like a great trumpet or thunders like a drum. Cool red, matter, like any other fundamentally cold color, can be deepened, especially by an intermixture of azure. The character of the color changes, the inward glow increases, the active element gradually disappears. But this active element is never so wholly absent as in deep green. There always remains a hint of renewed vigor, somewhere out of sight, waiting for a certain moment to burst forth afresh. In this lies the great difference between a deepened red and a deepened blue, because in red there is always a trace of the material. A parallel in music are the sad middle tones of a cello. A cold light red contains a very distinct bodily or material element, but it is always pure like the fresh beauty of the face of a young girl. The singing notes of a violin express this exactly in music. Warm red intensified by a suitable yellow is orange. This blend brings red almost to the point of spreading out towards the spectator. But the element of red is always sufficiently strong to keep the color from flippancy. Orange is like a man, convinced of his own powers. Its note is that of the angelus, or of an old violin. Just as orange is red brought nearer to humanity by yellow, so violet is red withdrawn from humanity by blue. But the red and violet must be cold, for the spiritual need does not allow of a mixture of warm red with cold blue. Violet is therefore both in the physical and spiritual sense a cooled red. It is consequently rather sad and ailing. It is worn by old women, and in China as a sign of mourning. In music it is an English horn, or the deep notes of wood instruments, for example a bassoon. The two last mentioned colors, orange and violet, 
are the fourth and last pair of antitheses of the primitive colors. They stand to each other in the same relation as the third antitheses, green and red, that is, as complementary colors. As in a great circle, a serpent biting its own tail, the symbol of eternity of something without end, the six colors appear that make up the three main antitheses, and to right and left stand the two great possibilities of silence, death and birth. It is clear that all I have said of these simple colors is very provisional and general, and so also are those feelings, joy, grief, etc., which have been quoted as parallels of the colors. For these feelings are only the material expressions of the soul. Shades of color, like those of sound, are of a much finer texture and awake in the soul emotions too fine to be expressed in words. Certainly each tone will find some probable expression in words, but it will always be incomplete, and that part which the word fails to express will not be unimportant, but rather the very kernel of its existence. For this reason words are, and will always remain, only hints, mere suggestions of colors. In this impossibility of expressing color in words, with the consequent need for some other mode of expression, lies the opportunity of the art of the future. In this art, among innumerable rich and varied combinations, there is one which is founded on firm fact, and that is as follows. The actual expression of color can be achieved simultaneously by several forms of art, each art playing its separate part, and producing a whole which exceeds in richness and force any expression attainable by one art alone. The immense possibilities of depth and strength to be gained by combination or by discord between the various arts can be easily realized. It is often said that admission of the possibility of one art helping another amounts to a denial of the necessary differences between the arts. This is, however, not the case. As has been said, an absolutely similar inner appeal cannot be achieved by two different arts. Even if it were possible, the second version would differ at least outwardly. But suppose this were not the case. That is to say, suppose a repetition of the same appeal, exactly alike, both outwardly and inwardly, could be achieved by different arts. Such repetition would not be merely superfluous. To begin with, different people find sympathy in different forms of art, alike on the active and passive side among the creators or the receivers of the appeal. But further and more important, repetition of the same appeal thickens the spiritual atmosphere, which is necessary for the maturing of the finest feelings, in the same way as the hot air of a greenhouse is necessary for the ripening of certain fruit. An example of this is the case of the individual, who receives a powerful impression from constantly repeated actions, thoughts, or feelings, although if they came singly they might have passed by unnoticed. We must not, however, apply this rule only to the simple examples of the spiritual atmosphere. For this atmosphere is like air, which can be either pure or filled with various alien elements. Not only visible actions, thoughts, and feelings with outward expression make up this atmosphere, but secret happenings of which no one knows, unspoken thoughts, hidden feelings are also elements in it. Suicide, murder, violence, low and unworthy thoughts, hate, hostility, egotism, envy, narrow patriotism, partisanship, are elements in the spiritual atmosphere. And conversely, self-sacrifice, mutual help, lofty thoughts, love, unselfishness, joy in the success of others, humanity, justness, are the elements which slay those already enumerated as the sun slays the microbes and restore the atmosphere to purity. The second and more complicated form of repetition is that in which several different elements make mutual use of different forms. In our case, these elements are the different arts summed up in the art of the future. And this form of repetition is even more powerful, for the different natures of men respond to the different elements in the combination. For one, the musical form is the most moving and impressive. For another, the pictorial. For the third, the literary, and so on. There reside, therefore, in arts which are outwardly different, hidden forces equally different, so that they may all work in one man towards a single result, even though each art may be working in isolation. This sharply defined working of individual colors is the basis on which various values can be built up in harmony. Pictures will come to be painted, veritable artistic arrangements, 
planned in shades of one color chosen according to artistic feeling the carrying out of one color the binding together and admixture of two related colors are the foundations of most colored harmonies from what has been said above about color working from the fact that we live in a time of questioning experiment and contradiction we can draw the easy conclusion that for a harmonization on the basis of individual colors our age is especially unsuitable perhaps with envy and with a mournful sympathy we listen to the music of mozart it acts as a welcome pause in the turmoil of our inner life as a consolation and as a hope but we hear it as the echo of something from another age long past and fundamentally strange to us the strife of colors the sense of balance we have lost tottering principles unexpected assaults great questions apparently useless striving storm and tempest broken chains antitheses and contradictions these make up our harmony the composition arising from this harmony is a mingling of color and form each with its separate existence but each blended into a common life which is called a picture by the force of the inner need only these individual parts are vital everything else such as surrounding conditions is subsidiary the combination of two colors is a logical outcome of modern conditions the combination of colors hitherto considered discordant is merely a further development for example the use side by side of red and blue colors in themselves of no physical relationship but from their very spiritual contrast of the strongest effect is one of the most frequent occurrences in modern choice of harmony Harmony today rests chiefly on the principle of contrast, which has for all time been one of the most important principles of art. But our contrast is an inner contrast, which stands alone and rejects the help, for that help would mean destruction, of any other principles of harmony. It is interesting to note that this very placing together of red and blue was so beloved by the primitive both in Germany and Italy that it has till today survived, principally in folk pictures of religious subjects. One often sees in such pictures the virgin in a red gown and a blue cloak. It seems that the artist wished to express the grace of heaven in terms of humanity and humanity in terms of heaven. Legitimate and illegitimate combinations of colors, contrasts of various colors, the overpainting of one color with another, the definition of colored surfaces by boundaries of various forms, the overstepping of these boundaries, the mingling and the sharp separation of surfaces, all these open great vistas of artistic possibility. One of the first steps in the turning away from material objects into the realm of the abstract was, to use the technical artistic term, the rejection of the third dimension, that is to say the attempt to keep a picture on a single plane. Modeling was abandoned. In this way the material object was made more abstract and an important step forward was achieved. This step forward has, however, had the effect of limiting the possibilities of painting to one definite piece of canvas, and this limitation has not only introduced a very material element into painting, but has seriously lessened its possibilities. Any attempt to free painting from this material limitation, together with the striving after a new form of composition, must concern itself first of all with the destruction of this theory of one single surface. Attempts must be made to bring the picture onto some ideal plane, which shall be expressed in terms of the material plane of the canvas. There has arisen out of the composition in flat triangles a composition with plastic three-dimensional triangles, that is to say with pyramids, and that is cubism. But there has arisen here also the tendency to inertia, to a concentration on this form for its own sake, and consequently once more to an impoverishment of possibility. But that is the unavoidable result of the external application of an inner principle. A further point of great importance must not be forgotten. There are other means of using the material plane as a space of three dimensions in order to create an ideal plane. The thinness or thickness of a line, the placing of the form on the surface, the overlaying of one form on another may be quoted as examples of artistic means that may be employed. Similar possibilities are offered by color, which, when rightly used, can advance or retreat, and can make of the picture a living thing, and so achieve an artistic expansion of space. The combination of both means of extension in harmony or concord is one of the richest and most powerful elements 
in purely artistic composition. End of chapter 6 Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine